Good day, everybody. Welcome back to the Deal Scout. Um, we've, we hope you've enjoyed the seven-minute series. And then every once in a while, one of my, my friends, I say, you know what, there's, there are some things that we need to kind of unpack their, their journey, their story, because I think it's helpful for fellow deal makers out there. And if you'd like to learn more about like how to speak with a VC and some of the things to, to approach, we just did an interview with Guy and it was a, it was a seven minute clip. You guys could always go back and watch that. But this is the, the part where we unfold the deal, the deal makers journey some of the things they've accomplished in the space. And so if you're interested in the world of venture capital, uh, this is going to be an episode for you. So I have my friend Guy, who's going to come in and kind of unpack his story, some of the things that he's accomplished, and maybe some input and advice for you all that could help you in your deal making journey. So Guy, welcome back to the Deal Scout. It's really great to see you again. Thank you. Nice to see you again, too. Yeah. All right. So Let's just say uh, I'm going to announce you on stage somewhere. What are some of the highlights from your journey that I could share with the community, things that you're, you know, you've accomplished in the world of venture capital and business? I think, I think the best thing would be to, uh, we'll talk about mostly my venture capital experience, which is what's relevant to, uh, to our audience here today. Uh, as a venture capitalist, I started in when I, uh, 1989 when I was uh, I had just finished business school at University of Chicago, and uh, it was a serendipitous process. Uh, anybody who gets into the venture business is always a lucky act of God type of a situation, um, and I was incredibly lucky to get in. And I was uh, I was with a firm at the time that invested in three areas: life sciences, which we defined as medical biotech. And uh, uh, back then it was uh, diagnostics. And then that firm also had a technology practice and they also had a media practice. Uh, I came in as, a, as an associate. Uh, I became a partner after three years. And uh, 89 to 92, became a partner in 92. 96, uh, we spun off and we started Alta Partners, which was now our own firm. It was four of us. And uh, Alta Partners was the West Coast group of uh, my previous firm called Burr Egan de Layage. And Alta Partners started out as a uh, probably 60, 70% life sciences firm, just based on our staffing. And again, life sciences defined my biotech, med tech, and back then uh, diagnostics. As we, as the field evolved, we added, you know, precision medicine, we added genomics and so on and so forth, you know, and then today uh, people would probably have AI in there as well uh, in the life sciences space. So uh, the journey was, you know, I was a co I was a co-founder in 1996. So 89 to 96, uh, uh, my previous firm, 96, I started my own firm called Alta Partners without too much, uh, you know, taking too much time here, Alta Partners. Uh, through uh, 96 to 2016, we raised eight funds worth $2 billion <clears throat> total. Um, we ended up being a life sciences only firm. <clears throat> we did $180 uh, deals. We took about 100 to 110 of them public. We sold another 20 to 30, and then the rest just did not work out. Um, our companies have raised billions and billions of dollars. Um, we've developed uh, products and, and drugs for um, any any therapeutic category you can think about, you know, cancer, heart, uh, you know, cardiovascular, renal, uh, urology. Uh, you know, we've just been involved in every single area of, of the life sciences. Um, I think when you do 120 IPOs as a firm, I think you can say that doing an IPO is something we're experts at. I didn't do 100, 120 myself, of course. I was a founder, I, you know, but I did maybe 20 myself, 20 to 25 myself. Uh, I didn't sell all the companies that we sold, but I sold about a dozen of our companies. But I was involved in all the processes that went on with regards to making investments, investing in company, management companies, and exiting companies. Of course, there's a big side of my business, which is called the fundraising side, which uh, your entrepreneurs will appreciate because that is the one moment when I'm in your shoes. And that is the one moment when I know how hard it is. And I never forgot how hard it was to actually go out and fundraise from limited partners. And that always, always gave me uh, empathy towards when you have to walk into my door 
and ask me for money because I know exactly what it's like. Yeah, I think that this is such a, a great point that I think uh, startups and founders out there uh, really, really can listen in and, and learn a lot. Because a lot of people might not understand the VC model. They think that the venture capitalists are, are people who scratched off a ticket and, and won a billion dollars, and now they're just playing playing with money. But, you know, there's major roles that a, that a, a venture capitalist has to do. One, you know, as a GP, and maybe you can highlight that, but, you know, like maybe explain what the roles of a GP, not just, you know, scratching off tickets and, you know, in, in cash and checks, right? But, you know, like kind of give us an overview of the roles and responsibility of a general partner. Yeah. So, so it's really important to uh, understand, uh, again, I, 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 you know, a big part of my focus here is on the, the fact that let's demystify human ca uh, venture capital and venture capitalists. I think that's really, really important because sometimes there's this perception that it's this club and, you know, they do things and, and they have all the, all the power and they have all the money and so on. Uh, as, as, as we progress, you know, I'll make sure that's the point that we talk about. But to your point about a GP. So first of all, you don't start as a GP. You become a GP. You kind of earn it. It's an up and out process, at least in my firm. You know, you came in and you as an associate, as a partner, as a principal, and then you, you kind of made it in. Uh, into the, the the club, if you like, um, uh, being a GP is a, is probably different from anything anyone's ever done. If you've been in in a conventional corporate world, uh, uh, because it's you look at probably six to seven deals a week. So imagine eight pitches a week you're getting from people you've never met before that either your partners are bringing in or that you're bringing in for your partners to see. The second thing you're doing now that you've made investments is you're actually sitting on a board. And the the conventional wisdom is that one venture capitalist can probably sit on eight boards. Not, you know, Sometimes you do 10, sometimes you do six, but it's about eight boards. So if you think about early stage venture capital and eight boards, that means, and you have monthly board meetings. That's eight days of both of board meetings out of twenty a month, and a lot of them are not in your in your you know backyard. You know, you have to take a flight to Boston in my case, so you have to take a flight to San Diego in our case, um, Seattle sometimes. So there's a lot of travel time that takes place into board meetings, and then you have a board meeting, and then you you head back. So you need to make time for your travel to seeing companies and being on a board. And then you have extra calls on boards, especially when a company is public. Now you have a committees you're involved with, audit committee, uh, nominating committee, uh, comp committee. Right? So you've got to do all of this. At the same time, the lifeblood of what we do is looking at new deals. So we cannot ignore that aspect. Even if you have six boards, your partnership has just raised a fund and they're looking at deals all the time. So now, uh, you know, you can't forget that because it's easier to forget that, you know, it's about new companies, new blood, uh, you know, looking at new things. And then uh, you're managing your portfolio. In my case, I was involved in managing my own partnership. And as one would expect, you know, VCs are an interesting breed, you know, smartest people in the room, you know, all of, all of the things you want to mention about herding cats, uh, coming up to consensus, so on and so forth. Uh, nothing easy about that in general. And that's why they are who they are. You know, they, they, that, that's the kind of personality you, you, you attract. Um, so managing companies, finding companies and investing in companies. But again, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have clients, which is our, our investors. And we have to make sure our clients are satisfied with our work uh, in general, which means we have to communicate with them how things are going. But every three years, we go fundraise. So as you were saying, Josh, I didn't scratch a thing and it was, oh, I got $100 million, let me go invest it. I had to go and, and hat in hand and explain why my my company, my my people, my staff was going to be competitive or better than competitive in a, in a world that's already very risky 
And, you know, the risk rewards are, that's why it's called venture capital. It's a very, you know, a lot of things don't work in this world. Um, and explain why they should write a check to me. The same way you entrepreneurs come to me to explain to me why I should write a check in you. So that's another thing we also do. It's, it's, it's LP relations. So a GP has several responsibilities. I think the thing I would, and this is maybe inside baseball, but but you want your GP to be good at all of the above. Mm. We're better in some things than others, just in, and also sometimes we're more interested in, uh, in some things than we are in others, but we have to be good at all of the above because otherwise we're not doing the best job for our, I see two constituents, three constituencies that I cared about in my business, my investors, my partners slash employees, and my portfolio companies. Yeah. These are our constituencies and everything we do is about them. Yeah. It's a, it's a three-legged stool, right? You have to keep the LPs happy or your fund runs out and then you can't, you know, support your, your, your internal team and your portfolio company. Your no. internal management team has to keep running, keep the lights on, keep bringing new deals to the table, keep bringing new investors or strategic partners to the table. And then you still have to manage the, the portfolio companies and guide them, open up doors for them, share, share with them new tactics, technologies, and, and, and techniques, right? So it's, if any one of those fail at any time, the portfolio could crash, right? The fund could not do well. Exactly, exactly. And 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 uh, again, it depends on who's who people's preferences. So in my case, um, you know, we uh, in, in early stage companies, venture capitalists actually help hire the whole C suite. Yeah. So I'm interviewing a VP of R and D as well. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes if they want me to take a look at even someone one layer beneath and of course, you know, th then, then I will, because, because that's my job, you know, and I, I, I'm going to help this entrepreneur as much as I can, as much as they need. And now if you're on the entrepreneurial side, make sure you use your VCs talents, not just the VC themselves, but their firm sometimes to the absolute optimum. Don't let an opportunity of one of your venture capitalists' talents or their partners get away because you're too busy running the everyday business. That's such a it's such a good point. Uh, I've seen uh, you know a founder when they're raising capital to grow or you know to 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 hit the next level of of uh, success for their for their business. You know they look at a, a check check comes in they're like oh man this is so exciting we have to take it and you know there's in the in the world of vc there's you know smart capital and and dumb capital and um you know i learned this i learned this from a, a friend who's uh, one of the most influential women in, in venture capital she said josh when you partner with someone it, it will cost you more to take dumb capital than it will to to hold out and wait for smart capital so she says it's wealth you want, you want to take money and partner with the VC so they become a strategic partner. You want wealth, wisdom, and you want them to go to work for you because you both are aligned for the, 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 the big exit or the big success, right? Did yeah. I miss anything in the, the wealth, wisdom, and work when it comes to smart capital and who you should partner with and take money from? You know, I, 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 I'm always reluctant to make that analogy because of the way the way uh you know, you don't want to be hyperbolic, but you uh, tell me another relationship as an entrepreneur that you have with a human being uh, that sounds like what with your venture capitalist, well, it's with your partner, wife, uh, uh, you know, significant other. I mean, we are, we become part of your family. And you probably see us as much as you see your family a lot of times. I'm not going to be in your office every day. But you're seeing me once a month, which for some people is longer more than they see their own parents. Um, so, so I would add, you know, let's not forget it's also a marriage um, with the 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 venture capitalist. As soon as there's this match, and we do the first investment. So you've been doing this for for thirty five years. Um, <laughs> this is might be a silly question, but like, 
are you are you still in the game? How old are you? What are you putting your focus on today? Like, where, where's your energy go now? No, there's never a silly question. I always always tell my entrepreneurs that because you can't believe how many silly questions I ask when they come and talk to me about the next disease that I've never heard of in my life, right? Yeah. And they want me to invest in it. So there's never a silly question. Uh, for me, uh, I started in '89. Uh, I'm actually, uh, you, you know, the VC business is not a business that you get out of overnight. Uh, so I'm winding down uh, right now, and uh, it's because I've got other interests, and we can talk about those in the future. Uh, and but I'm I'm usually people don't wind down in the VC. People will kind of die in their boots, but it's uh, that's just not that's just not my style. I think uh, 35 years, all this experience, amazing investments, and amazing companies that have had such an impact on on health and global health. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's it's been it's been a great ride. And uh, and the experiences that I've gotten and the people that I've met and uh, anecdotes I can discuss and the successes and the failures and uh, you, you know I I can't complain the, the journey's been incredible. I think a lot of times people hear the word venture capitalist and they think about the you know the guys or gals who wear the sleeveless you know vest and they driving around in their Range Rovers or whatever and you know they're just they're just constantly just crushing it on the phone. But we don't hear about the. We hear the failures of the entrepreneur all the time. Yeah. We very rarely hear the failures of a VC. It could be, you know, maybe you could share some of the, you know, you call it behind the, behind the, you know, the baseball insider baseball, yeah. right? But like, what are some of the failures that you see happen in the world of VC? Okay, so so uh, first uh, the 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 since I started in this business. Uh, there, there has been this, uh, if you want, later stage investment world that has developed, and it's the, the buyout world. And these are the people with the vests and, uh, you know, the Range Rovers and talking on the phone all the time. It's a little bit more of an investment banker slash consultant persona. VCs are nerdy, you know. We're people that want to understand the science to the to the smallest molecule so that we can kind of figure out if that's how this is going to work or if it's a device company i want to understand exactly how the technology is going to work when it gets inside of your heart and it does a surgery on your one of your uh, valves you know so so and 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 most of the time you know we don't have vests we're wearing, <laughs> we're like in a uh, you know maybe like a polo or or a or sometimes even less. It depends on who you're talking to. So, um, and we deal with doctors and engineers all the time in my world. So we try to match how they dress a lot of times. And it depends where this doctor and engineer is. But you're behind the scenes failure. So uh, when it comes to the IT side of our business, um, the rule is, you know, you go to bat 10 times and you probably hit it out of the park once or twice. And then the other eight fail or, you know, two of them kind of barely survive and the other six fail. You know, there's, there's everybody has their different formulas. In life sciences, because science doesn't die, uh, we have a much lesser, you know, write-off ratio than, than our uh, colleagues do on the other side. But we, we also don't have the same uh, multiples on huge successes, you know. WhatsApp got sold for sixteen billion dollars twenty years ago, and you know it's an app where people talk to each other. You know, so I'm trying to solve cancer, and I sell the company for a billion or two. You know, it's just it's just different worlds. But but twenty WhatsApps will die, whereas twenty cancer companies won't die. They'll just kind of hang in there and go on and go on because science takes so long. So we all have failures. It's an accepted thing. Again, that that uh, if you're on the IT side, six, seven are going to fail. If you're on our side, four, five are going to fail. They fail all the time. They fail for different reasons. In our case, they fail because the science doesn't work on humans that were great uh, previously in a petri dish and perhaps in some uh, clinical trials on animals. But then you get to a big number of humans and it just doesn't work well. So that's a failure that happens all, all the time. Um, and companies that have revenues, a lot of times you fail because you don't hit your revenues and cash is the problem. And, you know, so there's all these different things, the different things that happens when it comes to to failure. We all have them. 
And I think uh, there's nothing to be, to be ashamed. I can tell you as somebody who came from overseas at the age of 15, um, I never understood baseball because what do you mean the guy hits 0. 0.320 and that's a that's like a rock and roll star for doing this? I'm like, that means 0. 0.680 is failing, right? Thank God I had the baseball analogy because venture capital is no different. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're hitting 0. 0.320, you're a rock star. Um, so, you know, I learned that. So how do you, when it comes to failure, when you had, you know, had your first couple failures, because you've been in this a long time, right? We could go through the numbers, 120 IPOs, and you sold off a bunch of companies and raised a billion bucks, right? Like you've, you've done a lot of successes, but within that, that means that there was quite a few failures in there. How do you, what advice do you have for us deal makers on how to not take failure personal, not to be ashamed of it? Right. We want to do our best. Right. We pour blood, sure. sweat and tears. I'll work. Sure. I'll work 12 hour days to avoid a nine to five. Right. So how do, how do what, what advice do you have for us on not taking it personal, not being ashamed of it and leaning into the next thing? OK, so first, if I can make a plug for America. Yeah. Um, failure in America is seen as a sign of growth. You fail in other cultures and it's over. Um, you fail here and people say, hmm, Josh has learned from this. So let's hope Josh has learned from this. We're going to give him another chance because he, because now Josh and or let's say entrepreneur named Susie. Susie knows exactly what she needs to do this next time or she knows better what to do the next time because the first time didn't work. So so uh, the, the the there is no negative impact on failure in our world in general. Now, failures hurt. You know, I'm going to give you a failure that we had. Uh, you know, it was a who's who venture capital syndicate. And and just so the entrepreneurs understand that, you know, we take these failures as hard as you guys do. We had this great company and congestive heart failure. And, and the entrepreneur was brilliant. And he, and, and he had figured out that if you put a sock around the heart, it's not going to expand as you're having congestive heart failure. And big, one of the big problems is myopathy where the heart grows, right? So we ran clinical trials, spent, we raised lots and lots of money round one, round two. And every time we'd get more and more name venture people and the board was a, you know, all-star board. And we did uh, our early clinical trials, which we had done in Germany. We got very good clinical results as to what the FDA was asking for. So we then raised a lot more money and we ran the subsequent clinical trial, which is a very large one. And in this clinical trial, we actually did not just Europe, but we did Europe and the US. Um, lots of reasons why why people do clinical trials in Europe initially. Uh, you know, we could, that's another discussion. Um, we run these clinical trials and uh, two thirds of our patients are in the US, one third of our patients are outside of the US, again, mostly Europe. And the trial failed. And the, 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 the test was called a six minute walk. So people with congestive heart failure, how far can they walk in six minutes? And in the previous test, they had double, triple the distance they were walking versus placebo. And in this particular test, there was no difference. And it fails. So now you go home and you're thinking, how can that be? What happened? The it's over for the company because you're not going to get FDA approval with a failed clinical trial. A lot of people will kind of go back and see if there's a subgroup that, with whom it works and what happened, what didn't happen. And you go, you know, if, if you let it, especially as an entrepreneur, you go through, a, but but we do too, because we've just lost a lot of money. So everybody is in this funk now about this. And it fails because humans are humans. It, it could have failed because in the clinical trial in America, the centers you chose were not as careful in monitoring patients as the, as the patients in Germany in the previous trial. It could... Fail because Germans are tougher than Americans. 
they walk more when they have a, even if the sock is not working, right? Yeah. <laughs> you just don't know. And you try really hard to find out. And after a lot of work, you do find out the reason, but the, the, what it's a failure. We lost everybody. All of us have lost 10 million, 12 million, 8 million, 4 million, whatever the number is. And the entrepreneur just saw their lives just go up and, you know, they have nothing left, the whole management team. So failures are painful. So painful. I still remember, I remember much more of my failures than I do my successes because it's, that's kind of a lot of times where my head goes because I'm, 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 I'm about doing the next thing and doing it better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it crushed me. I wound up in a hospital when I, you know, I had my first major, actually it was my second major business failure. And I was so anxious because people to depend on me. I was building a team. My, my wife and my kids depended on me. And it like, it gave me anxiety. I didn't sleep. It was, it was the most stressful thing. Right. And I've been through some pretty stressful things. It was top five most stressful things I've ever been through. And, uh, I would love I would love your your perspective. You say one of your superpowers on our previous interview is your perspective of of how you see things, maybe because of your past. But when when I had to go tell someone I lost their money, right? We went all in. I mean, I, I poured out my blood, sweat. they saw how hard I was working, right? I wasn't buying a Lamborghini or Ferraris or anything mm -hmm. like that. Like everything I, I was eating ramen noodles and everything I put into it. But I failed and I had to go tell them, I'm sorry, I lost your money. What is the, I hope nobody has to do this, right? But like, if they do have to tell people that they lost their money, what's the best way for an entrepreneur to come to their VC and say, I failed? So, so the good VCs will see your failure as their failure. They won't differentiate between them and you because I was there once a month and sometimes more talking to you about your company. So it's our failure. And I think the question then is how do we tell the world that this is what happened? And this is where internal fortitude is crucial. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm a sports guy. I use a lot of sports analogies. Um, when you know that you gave it everything you've got, and the final score is that you lost the game. You have nothing to be ashamed of because you gave it everything you got. Now, if I don't know that you didn't give it everything you had because of whatever reason, that's between you and your investors and God. Right? So, so I, I back people that give it every, I, I back people who, when the game is over, can barely walk off the field because they gave it everything they had. And I'm that kind of person. Yeah. And, and if you do that, Josh, I don't think, you know, like in your case where you, you know, it's okay. It was the first time. And if we and I were friends, I would have said, Hey man, you know, let me go buy you a beer. We can talk about this. It's uh, you know, you, you, if you did everything you can, then there's, there's not, you know, there's nothing else you could have done. And that's how science works or that's how business works. or that's how, you know, you choose, you choose the area, you know, not everything succeeds all the time and not everything succeeds all the time for rational reasons. And sometimes there are a lot of irrational successes and they just, it's just the way of the world. And we just need to have that perspective. Yeah. You talk about don't be ashamed. I'll tell you when I hit that failure, I took it personal and I took it uh, as a part of my identity. It defined who I was, that failure piece. So you said, hey, let's go have a beer. I went, I'm an extroverted person. I have a massive network. I, I know a lot of people have a lot of friends, but I retracted and I went inward and, um, and it was so, it was such an unhealthy like stage of my life because I was so embarrassed by what just happened. And, uh, you know, I think that that's such a good point where you're like, hey, I know you failed. You gave it your all, you're limping. You know, you might need some extra medications to take care of all the anxieties or whatever you're, you know, dealing with. But like, let's go meet. Let's go spend some time together and talk about it. That, that post-mortem, right, after, after yeah. the death of the company, is so very, I, I hope entrepreneurs hear this and be, you know, encouraged to talk about both their successes and failures. 
especially if you have the right VC or the right board, don't hide it from them. Go talk with them about it because I promise you, like I went bankrupt at one point in my life and I, and I went and I was talking with a billionaire and I was so ashamed. And I said, man, I, I just went bankrupt. And they go, join the club. We, you know, we've, all, we've all been bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. And yes. it, for the first time I realized like, if I could remove my mask and be authentic with someone, they're, they've gone through the exact same struggles and that's why they're good investors. Yes. And if we want to get into a little bit more of a nuance is that you're going to have a board of four or five, six people. And just because we're humans, there's, there are going to be one or two people you feel closer to than others. Uh, reach out. Yeah. You know, I usually, I usually reach out to my entrepreneurs or my CEOs when things go badly, just to kind of check temperature. But if I'm not their go-to person, it's okay. Reach out to your go-to person and just and uh, commiserate. If you have a venture capitalist that says, "Oh, you failed and I didn't," uh, back to the to the to the uh, individual you mentioned earlier, she's right. You know, you picked the wrong person. It's our failure. We were there every single step of the way with you. We trusted you. And you know, I mean, I think that's that's the thing here. Guy, you, I love your human approach because sometimes we see certain people as almost like celebrities, untouchable, you know, robots, no feelings, no emotions. But, you know, in the first interview that we did together, you kept on saying, be yourself, show up, you know, be the best version of yourself, but be your, be yourself. And then in, in this, you're, you're saying like, this is a part of the, the journey that you chose or maybe life chose for you, you know, or maybe God designed for you, right? Like, so being an entrepreneur is hard. Being an investor is hard. Being a VC is hard. These things are hard and we're all in a very difficult game together. Um, man, I wish, and maybe you and I just have to do more recordings in the future because you've got an interesting past, but I don't think it's time to start unpacking that. Your, your past has led to building the, the fortitude that you have, the perspective you have on the United States and, and such, and, and it's causing you to, to rise into leadership, maybe some political stuff in the future, but we don't have the time to unpack that now. This might be just part one of maybe a series of so. Um, but for people who do want to connect with you, follow your work, uh, and maybe um, find out how to engage with you What's a good place for fellow deal makers to connect with you and do that? So we uh, the easiest is askgee.com, a s k g u y dot com. It's uh, it's guy, but it's pronounced gee. I always say you need to ask my parents. So well, this is let's stick into people's minds. I do I do several social media talks about uh, very very small pieces of advice I give entrepreneurs or in other other areas, economy, some politics. But I think that's how you can reach me, and and uh, I'm always looking forward. I I um, access access to people with my experience is difficult, and that's why I always want to be available uh, all i re all i ask is just you know give me 24 hours to respond and please respect my time um but i'll get back to you you know yeah yeah that's so good so fellow deal makers as always say thank you let's start by being a, a community of gratitude say thank you for our guests they've come and they've they've shared their story and their their journey their experience with you so reach out and say thank you you could connect with them on LinkedIn and and go directly to their website and and find a way to you know engage with them, but uh, if you are a deal maker and maybe you've had a massive failure, I just want to encourage you and inspire you to maybe go talk with your board or or someone that you trust and and kind of walk through that journey. Don't retreat as a deal maker as an entrepreneur. Um, you got to go to the next one. You got to go to the next success because it's you know the 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 success is right around the corner for you. But don't don't give up. Right. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on your your God given gifts. Um, as always, uh, if you have a deal that you'd like to talk about here on the Deal Scout, head on over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, and we'll talk to you all on the next episode. I love you guys and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.